This is the Mandelbrot set, one of the most beautiful and remarkable discoveries in the entire history of mathematics. Yet it was discovered as recently as 1980. The invention of the silicon chip in the 1970s created a revolution in computers and communication and hence transformed our way of life. We are now seeing another revolution which is going to change our view of the universe and give us a better understanding of its working. I'm Alf C. Clarke. I write science fact and science fiction. You may know my movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I've seen some remarkable developments and inventions in my lifetime, but one of the most extraordinary is the Mandelbrot set and fractal geometry. This film will explore the fractal universe, and on our voyage of discovery, we'll be helped by Professor Ian Stewart, of the Mathematics Institute, University of Warwick. Dr. Michael Barnsley, former professor of mathematics at Georgia Institute of Technology, who received a two and a half million dollar government grant in 1991 to develop fractal image compression systems. Professor Stephen Hawking, the mathematician and cosmologist, and author of the best-selling book, A Brief History of Time. And finally, Dr. Benoit Mandelbrot, whose unorthodox mathematics led to the discovery of the Mandelbrot set and fractal geometry. It's not easy to describe the Mandelbrot set visually. It looks like a man, it looks like a cat, it looks like a cactus, it looks like a cockroach. It's got little bits and pieces that remind us of almost anything that you can see out in the real world, particularly living things. So it has a a character that reminds us of a lot of things, and, and yet it itself is unique and, and new. Such things that can be magnified forever and have infinite precision do exist, but they're not touchable. It's a geometrical shape, an, an icon, if you wish, which somehow embodies as an example a very important aspect of how the world works. Somebody recently actually called this set the thumbprint of God. I have here the full set, about six inches across. Now, if I blow this up, I'll increase the magnification now 13 times. And you see more and more detail is appearing. And the interesting thing is you see mini Mandelbrots, replicas, almost identical, yet perhaps subtly different of the original set. And I can go on doing this. Here's a magnification of more than 3,000 times. So the original picture, about six inches across, is now half a mile across. And no matter how much we magnified it, a million times, a billion times, until the original set was bigger than the entire universe, we would still see new patterns, new images emerging because the frontier of the M set is infinitely complex. And when I say infinitely, I really mean that. Most people, when they say infinitely, they mean only or rather big. But this is really infinity. Although it's infinitely complex, it's based on incredibly simple principles, unlike almost everything in modern mathematics. In fact, anybody who can add and multiply can understand the principles on which it's based. You don't even have to subtract or divide, still less use logarithms or trigonometrical functions to comprehend how the Mandelbrot set is created. In fact, in principle, it could have been discovered any time in human history and not merely in 1980. But the problem is this, although it's only based on adding and multiplying, you have to carry out those operations millions, billions of times to create a complete set. And that's why it was not discovered until the era of modern computers. It was on the 1st of March, 1980, at IBM's Thomas J. Watson Research Center in upstate New York that Benoit Mandelbrot first glimpsed the M set. The seeds of this discovery were, in fact, sown decades before the M set was first seen. In Paris, in 1917, a mathematician called Gaston Julia 
publish papers connected with so-called complex numbers. The results of his endeavors eventually became known as Julia sets, although Julia himself never saw a Julia set. He could only guess at them, and it wouldn't be until the advent of modern computers that Julia sets could be seen for the first time. For me, the first step, almost a difficult mathematical, mathematical problem, was to program it and see how it, how it looked like. We started programming Julia sets of all kinds. It was extraordinarily great fun. And in particular, at one point, we became interested in Julia set of the simplest possible transformation. Z goes to Z squared plus C. So Z times Z plus C. I made many, many pictures of it. First of all, the first one was very rough. But the very rough picture, that was not the answer. Each rough picture asked a question. So I made another picture, another picture, another picture. And after a few weeks, we had this uh, very strong, overwhelming impression that this was a, a kind of big bear we have encountered. I think the most important implication is that from very simple formulas, you can get very complicated results. It's fundamental from viewpoint of the very base of science, because what is science? We have all this mess around us, things are totally incomprehensible, and then eventually, more or less rapidly, more or less hard to achieve, we find simple laws, simple formulas. In a way, a very simple formula, Newton's law, which is just also a few symbols, can, by hard work, explain the motion of planets around the sun and many, many other things, the 15th decimal. It's marvelous, a very simple formula explains all these very complicated things. There's an interesting parallel with the equation that almost everybody is familiar with, the only equation almost everybody is familiar with, E equals mc squared, Albert Einstein's equation that says matter and energy are equivalent to each other. That was a very simple equation with very far-reaching consequences. And the equation for the Mandelbrot set is equally simple, z equals z squared plus c. The letters in the Mandelbrot equation stand for numbers, unlike those in Einstein's equation where they stand for physical quantities, mass, velocity, energy. The Mandelbrot numbers are coordinates, positions on the plane defining the location of a spot. Another difference from Einstein's equation, and a very important one, is this double arrow. It's a kind of a two-way traffic sign. The numbers flow in both directions, constantly feeding back on themselves. This process of going round and round a loop is called iteration. It's rather like a dog chasing its own tail. The output of one operation becomes the input of the other, and so on and on and on. When the Mandelbrot equation is given a number representing a point, and that number is iterated through the equation, one of two things happen. Either the number gets bigger and bigger and shoots off to infinity, or it shrinks to zero. Depending on which happens, the computer then knows where to draw a boundary line. So what we get from this basic iteration is a kind of map dividing this world into two distinct territories. Outside of it are all the numbers that have the freedom of infinity. Inside it, numbers that are prisoners, trapped and doomed to ultimate extinction. Think of a computer screen. You're looking at each individual little element, each pixel of the screen. You pick one of these pixels, you apply this rule lots and lots of times, and either the pixel moves off and disappears completely from view, or it moves in towards a fixed point in the middle of the screen. And what you do is uh, you, you just want to distinguish between going off out to infinity or going into zero. So any point that moves into zero when you apply this rule you colour that point black. And any point that goes off to infinity, what, what people tend to do is colour it all sorts of wonderful rainbow hues about how fast it goes away. The important bit's the black bit in the middle. That's all the stuff that doesn't escape when you keep applying this rule. Now, the colours are completely arbitrary. They could be anything. But they are not meaningless. A very good analogy is the contour map, you'll see, of a mountain range, for example where the contours are drawn and colored, the areas are colored. The highest areas might be colored white, then brown, then green, then it went on into the sea, deeper and deeper blues, just to show where the various levels occur. 
So it's the same here. You can make the colors anything you like, but they do define the different areas of calculation. And you can change them and get the most gorgeous results. Just look at this. Now, you may think that the frontiers are moving, but there's no motion whatsoever.